or I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're they're just looking at the wrong indicators. Well, you you brought up um, chapters one and two from from currency wars, where you you basically highlight uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S. dollar. Is that the form it would take for you? Something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why.、Um, and, and by the way, when I when I wrote that, when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less that we know of, and they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more.、Um, so, but、uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, it's not going to be the rupee. But, but, but here's why.、Uh, well, a lot of reasons. But the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of hundred-dollar bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books.、Um, Not like dollars per se. So, if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist.、Uh, very small scale, very liquid. No primary dealers. No when issue trading. No auctions.、Um, no repo. None of sell. No settlement clearance. None of the、uh, the plumbing and the mechanics. Of、uh, of a mature bond market such as the、uh, the United States,、uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you you know somebody with exempt treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and and certainly the rupee will not replace the dollar as a reserve currency. However. What I was hypothesizing then, and I would、I'd、come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank,、um, UK law,、uh, put the gold in a third-party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency, or trade with them, or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you you would need the gold to to instill confidence.、Um, But、uh, they don't. They, again, they don't have bond markets, so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the rupee, aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim,、um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well,、uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they?、Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver. You know, fine art.、Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone. They estimate two hundred million dollars. You could have bought that for fifty thousand in the in the nineteen seventies.、Uh, that's that's a little more specialized. But there are you know natural resources,、uh, water, you know, etc.,、uh, energy, oil.、Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources,、um, you know, such as Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not.、Uh, I'm just giving these as an example. But、um, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself. But、uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio、um, is not a good one. And you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there?、Um, do we have a Uh, is is it just an aging population that truly can't work?、Um, I know that disability has been a has seen massive growth over the past like fifteen years.、Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having sixty two percent of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, 
There are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And no, you, you you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the the, the numerator, and how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now it's never a hundred percent, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles enter the workforce. And then that number went up. So it, like I guess it's never a hundred, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, uh, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit, you know, it's put a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working, or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home. Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think, a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But um, but a lot of people saved the money. But but there was a very there were de- very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money, they'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people lost the habit. A lot of people staying home watching, you know, maybe, uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, cause people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, there help one of the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level, like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker, uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a uh, entry level hamburger person. Um, so there are late, the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage, to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins, you know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at, 
big layoffs and they're, big, layoffs, they're big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, but none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if you're, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like, even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are. As an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Well, or I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are they are Russia and China. I'm curious to get your thoughts on central bank record buying of gold here and how Russia and China fit into this puzzle here. Now, China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons. U.S. was down a thousand tons after losing, uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey, uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month. Their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world. Uh, but central banks sure do, and I think that tells you something. Inflation, yeah, prices go up, so we understand that. Or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, has, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. And we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. The U.S. really started it. But U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Uh, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply because of the price of oil, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. The other source is, is demand, what's called demand pull inflation, which is more psychological. Consumers are thinking about choices and they say, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. I was going to wait six months, but hey, the price is going up. I better go buy it now before the price goes up. In the 70s, 1970s, we had both. We started with cost push from the, the Arab oil embargo. But it flipped into demand pull in the late 70s and it just spun out of control and Paul Volcker had to crush it. Today, the inflation is coming from the supply side. Some of the things we talked about, uh, um, you know, higher fuel costs. I mean, everything has to be transported. So fuel is part of everything. It gets built into the price of everything. Uh, and there are other, there are other shortages and bottlenecks and, uh, you know, costs that have to be taken up by manufacturers and distributors. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors, so they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. And this is the thing that the markets and investors are not ready for. They, inflation is gonna come down fast. There's even some danger of deflation and a major US recession in 2000, in, in 2023. And, and no one's ready for that. I mean, people talk about recession, but it's gonna be worse than they think. And then they wrap up the printing press again, Jim. 
Yes, but it doesn't work. You know, uh, nine trillion dollars of QE didn't do any good. I mean, how does the Fed do QE? They buy bonds from banks, give the money to the banks, the banks give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. What does that do for the economy? Nothing. Zero rates. You know, again, it, it doesn't. It doesn't work. They don't have the tools. They're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the... the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is, you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a, a radical change in how we pay for things. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor, as a bank, I think of it by weight. Because when someone said gold's really going up, I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. And when, you, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, this is a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numeraire. The numeraire is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever. And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. In 1914, when World War I started, all the major powers went off the gold standard. They said, we've got to keep our gold. This is real money, and this is how we're going to win the war. And the Bank of England was faced, uh, and the Exchequer was faced with the same choice. Keynes was an advisor to the Exchequer. He said, don't go off the gold standard. Stay on the gold standard. And the reason was that if you did that, you would preserve your reputation and preserve your credit. He said, the, the war is not going to be won with money or gold. It's going to be won with credit. But if you stay on the gold standard, you'll have the credit. And that's exactly what happened. Pierpont Morgan, uh, sorry, Jack Morgan, uh, Pierpont's son, uh, organized huge loans for England and France and nothing for Germany. And England won the war. So the point is, Keynes got that right. Now, flash forward, 1925, he's talking to Churchill, and Churchill wants to go back to the gold standard. And Keynes is telling him, you got the price wrong. You know, we can't go back at, you know, four pounds, 25, or whatever the exact rate was. Um, we've got to devalue the sterling by half because we doubled the money supply to fight the war. Churchill ignored Keynes' advice, and, um, and they went into a recession, depression, before the rest of the world. Flash forward 1944, you're at Bretton Woods. Keynes wanted a gold standard. And this isn't speculation. He wrote papers. He gave formal presentations. So 1914 is pro-gold. 1925, he's telling Churchill, you're nuts. You can't go back to a gold standard at this price. 1944, he's pro-gold again. I call that a pragmatist. Supply-side inflation can feed to the demand-side. Demand-side inflation can feed on itself. But supply-side inf inflation alone does not feed on itself. It tends to destroy itself. There's an old saying, you know, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. In other words, if you make them high enough, and going back to what I just said about putting gas in your tank, think of all the things you're not spending money on. And that causes business failures, layoffs, higher unemployment, lower velocity of money. You know, you, 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 you stay home, like you said, you don't go out basically. Um, and that's what's happening now. So we're starting to see inflation come down. When it comes down a little bit from, you know, 8.2% to 7.7%, you know, people go, oh, it's, it's still high. Well, it is still high, but that's a, that's a noticeable drop. And we've seen that a couple of months in a row. What's going to happen faster than markets and investors expect is that this inflation is going to come down so fast, it's going to be a strong form of disinflation. Now, disinflation is still inflation, but it's lower inflation and in terms of response functions it, it it bears a closer resemblance to deflation than it does to um inflation even though it's still a form of inflation when interest rates are coming sorry when inflation is coming down uh what else is going on well real interest rates are going up uh and the economy is slowing down 
and then it could even tip into deflation. That that would be uh, a shock to the system. I mean, in that world, cash is your best performing asset because the value of cash, the real value of cash, actually goes up in uh, deflation when everything else is crashing around you. So, um, so yeah, we're in inflation right now. It's painful, um, but it's starting to fade more quickly than people expect. And my forecast, uh, based on a lot of analysis, and it's all in the book, uh, sold out, is that uh, this disinflation, borderline deflation will prevail. And by really just in a few months, January, February, March 2023, if not sooner, we're going to be in a very severe recession. Um, and uh, people are going to be surprised at how quickly inflation comes down. And they won't be positioned for it in terms of their portfolios. I mean, for example, a uh, a uh, ten-year Treasury note would be a, a very good performing asset in this world because yield maturity on ten-year Treasury notes been recently four percent, and now it's around three and a half percent. That could come down to two and a half percent in a in a heartbeat, even lower, and that would produce huge capital gains. So it's so it's a big deal for investors and in, um, asset allocation and portfolio management, and uh, a lot of people don't see the uh, the disinflation coming. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year. Records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously the theories are that are, that are that they are Russia and China. I'm curious to get your thoughts on central bank record buying of gold here and how Russia and China fit into this puzzle here. Now, now, China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons. U.S. was down a thousand tons after losing, uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world, uh, but central banks sure do. And I think that tells you something. And this is the thing that the markets and investors are not ready for. They, inflation is going to come down fast. There's even some danger of deflation and a major U.S. recession in 2000, in, in 2023. And, and no one's ready for that. I mean, people talk about recession, but it's going to be worse than they think. And then they ramp up the printing press again, Jim. Yes, but it doesn't work. You know, uh, $9 trillion of QE didn't do any good. I mean, how does the Fed do QE? They buy bonds from banks, give the money to the banks, and the banks give it back to the Fed as extra reserves. What does that do for the economy? Nothing. Zero rates, you know, again, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. They don't have the tools. They're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the... the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is, you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested. You know, do you have? Uh, 
uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor or as a bank, I think of it by weight. Because when someone says gold's really going up, I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more, and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, there's a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numeraire. The numeraire is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever? And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight, and then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. In 1914, when World War I started, all the major powers went off the gold standard. They said, we've got to keep our gold. This is real money, and this is how we're going to win the war. And the Bank of England was faced, uh, and the Exchequer was faced with the same choice. Keynes was an advisor to the Exchequer. He said, don't go off the gold standard. Stay on the gold standard. And the reason was that if you did that, you would preserve your reputation and preserve your credit. He said, the, the war is not going to be won with money or gold. It's going to be won with credit. But if you stay on the gold standard, you'll have the credit. And that's exactly what happened. Pierpont Morgan, or sorry, Jack Morgan, uh, Pierpont's son, uh, organized huge loans for England and France and nothing for Germany. And England won the war. So the point is, Keynes got that right. Now, flash forward, 1925, he's talking to Churchill, and Churchill wants to go back to the gold standard. And Keynes is telling him, you got the price wrong. You know, we can't go back at, you know, four pounds, 25, or whatever the exact rate was. Um, we've got to devalue the sterling by half because we doubled the money supply to fight the war. Churchill ignored Keynes' advice and um, and they went into a recession, depression before the rest of the world. Flash forward 1944, you're at Bretton Woods. Keynes wanted a gold standard. And this isn't speculation. He wrote papers. He gave formal presentations. So 1914 is pro-gold. 1925, he's telling Churchill, you're nuts. You can't go back to a gold standard at this price. 1944, he's pro-gold again. I call that a pragmatist. Inflation, yeah, prices go up, so we understand that, or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, has, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called cost push. This comes from the supply side, so there's a shortage of oil. And we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. The U.S. really started, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Uh, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. The other source is, is demand, what's called demand pull inflation, which is more psychological. Consumers are thinking about choices and they say, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. I was going to wait six months, but hey, the price is going up. I better go buy it now before the price goes up. In the 70s, 1970s, we had both. We started with cost push from the, the Arab oil embargo. But it flipped into demand pull in the late 70s and it just spun out of control and Paul Volcker had to crush it. Today, the inflation is coming from the supply side. Some of the things we talked about, uh, um, you know, higher fuel costs. I mean, everything has to be transported. So fuel is part of everything. It gets built into the price of everything. Uh, and there are, other, there are other shortages and bottlenecks and, uh, you know, costs that have to be taken up by manufacturers and distributors. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors, so they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. You cannot forecast what they're going to do. It's a guessing game to, regarding the feds because they're, they're the ones that run the show, the Black Rocks and the, and the Black Stones and the, all the private equity groups that are in charge. If they put pressure on the Fed to lower interest rates, they're going to do it. It's not about we the people. It's about the ones running the show. You go back to 2020 when it all began. I'm the governor. I'm the mayor. I'm the senator. I'm the chancellor. I'm the premier. I'm the president. Lock down everything. We're going to flatten the curve. You flatten nothing.
You destroyed a load of businesses, lives and livelihoods all over the world. Oh, don't believe me. Look at the, the, the World Bank data and the, the, all the people have gone into poverty. Oh, oh, yeah, look at the inflation rate skyrocketing. You flatten nothing. And now they're doing it again. Oh, remember in, in 2020, by September 2020, after Labor Day, people would be going back into the offices? Oh, you forgot that one? Oh, let's go to 2021. Oh, remember people go back in the offices after Labor Day? Oh, yeah. What's the office occupancy rate over here in New York? That's about 30%. How about nationally? Oh, it's only 60% lower than it was before they started the COVID war in 2019. Oh, how about all the businesses that depend on commuters? Oh, you don't you don't need any of that. Oh, the subway travel, it's it's only 40% of what it used to be. How about all the theaters? Oh, the neon lights shining bright on Broadway? No, no. We're closing them down again. Oh, a city that depends on tourism? Oh, all the international regulations on on uh traveling overseas? Oh, America's travel, U.S. travel overseas from January 20, November 26th, the last data I looked at was December 9th, was down 77% from 2019 levels. Oh, it'll get better. It'll come back. I called it wrong in 2012. I thought the economy was going to crash in 2012. They invented a thing called quantitative easing. They didn't teach us that in Economics 101 at graduate school, nor did they teach us about zero and negative interest rate policy. They could come up with anything. The money people are in charge. Anybody that thinks they have a government of we the people they're still being taught in kindergarten to, to K-12 and, and, and graduate school. That's who's in control of the government. But now, let's go back to the facts. We had the BS from Janet Yellen. Oh, by the way, taken over by the Federal Reserve because she was the head of the Fed and now our Treasury Secretary, along with the guy playing the Fed head, Powell, going on for almost two years, they lied about it. They knew it was real. The Federal Reserve. Oh, yeah. Now looking to, uh, you know, and they're, they're in the midst of trying to fight um, the strongest inflationary environment since the 80s. Um, gearing up to uh, not just taper asset purchases, but start their interest rate hike scenario. Uh, but you've warned that an artificially low interest rate policy ending would create disaster for the global financial market. Don't they know this? They do know it. That's why they were lying about inflation being a year ago. Oh, hey, I'm the Fed chair. It's only temporary. You're full of baloney, Salenti. This isn't real interest rates. And that only went on until April. Then it became transitory. Oh, and also from Yellen, the other Fed head that's the Treasury Secretary now. How corrupt could it be right in front of you? The Fed head is now U.S. Treasury Secretary throwing out the same BS month after month after month. It's only temporary. And as you said, it's at the highest since 1982, but it's actually higher because they re -re they rigged the inflation numbers. Oh, your housing prices went up 19%? No, that's not inflationary. Oh, you mean the meat, meat prices went up? Oh, they're not eating steak now, they're eating beef, so no, that didn't go up either. The real inflation rate, according to John Williams' shadow stats, is about 15%. You actually have negative interest rates when you look at inflation. And the only reason the markets have gone up is all the cheap money they've pumped into it in the United States, in, in, in Japan, in, in the EU, all of this cheap money, merger and acquisition activity, all time high. Stock buybacks, boom, hitting another boom. All the cheap money artificially threw this thing up. All the cheap money coming in from governments to artificially prop it up. Hey, here's your $600 a week, stay home. Remember that one? So the whole thing has been artificial. My belief is when Fed rate hits 1.5%, this thing goes down hard, big, and the biggest crash in world history.
I said, what a bunch of baloney this is. They're shooting at this crap that, oh, inflation's only temporary. And then it went to transitory. So they were either too stupid to know what it was, where it was going, or they knew where it was going, which I believe they did. And they're artificially keeping the cheap money flowing in because when interest rates go up and the cheap money flow stops, the economy is going to go down and the equity markets are going to crash. Look at the insider trading. They're selling out now big time. It's like $69 billion. Meantime, stock buybacks are hit at all time high because they're getting the money for nothing, buying back the stock so it looks like there's less of them available and keep artificially pushing the prices up. Look at merger and acquisition activity, all time high, cheap money. When you look at the real interest rate, what, what was the, uh, the inflation rate that just came out? What was it, 6.8%? Oh, and what is the Fed rate? Oh, near zero. So what am I, stupid? You got negative interest rates. Oh, and Germany's now sinking possibly into a recession. The richest country in Europe. And they're still keeping interest rates into negative territory. This is criminality. Because the only ones that are benefiting are the bigs. The bigs. Look again at the merger and acquisition activity. Every day, every day, buying out and the little people going out of business. And the bigs are getting bigger. Here's my greatest fear and why I feel the way I do as a trend forecaster. When all else fails, they take you to war. I would say that the Fed's monetary policy will fail or is failing and fiscal policy will fail is in the process of failing even if gold didn't exist if you didn't have gold as a you know multi-millennial monetary standard even if gold wasn't there as a reference point which of course it is but these policies are failing anyway and there are a lot of reasons for that you know whenever i hear you know fiscal stimulus I say, well, no, the Fed can print money all day long and the Congress can spend money all day long, but don't call it stimulus. It's not going to have any stimulative effect. We're way, way past the Keynesian multiplier, which is now below one, meaning if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you don't even get a dollar's worth of GDP. You get some numbers, 70, 80 cents. They forget about the multiplier. It's actually now, uh, you know, divide or something that uh, reduces uh, GDP. Well, you don't get the GDP for the borrowing. And same thing with uh, monetary policy, because uh, unlike uh, Milton Friedman, the monetarists, the New Keynesians, the Austrians and everyone else, money printing has nothing to do with inflation. And they, they seem to, well, I don't know if they ever knew it, so I can't say they forgot it. So all the money printing and all the deficit spending will not stimulate the economy. And that's true anyway, but gold is signaling that. Look, all markets are try to be forward leaning. Some do it more successfully than others, more <laughs> accurately than others, but they try. I would, I would say that, yeah, people say, you know, the stock market is an efficient discounting mechanism for future events, for what they see in the future. And yeah, they look into the future, here's their forecast, they pick out a discount factor, they, they present value it and say, here's where, where stocks should be today based on where things are going to be, you know, six months or a year from now. And that's what they do sort of mathematically and analytically, except they're always wrong about the forecast. You, you got to get the forecast right <laughs> if the discounting process is going to mean anything. So markets go through the process, but they always get the future wrong. They, they're, they're not very good at predictive analytics. So um, this creates what I call the gap between the perception and the reality. Reality always wins, but not right away. Sometimes it takes a while. Gold, on the other hand, as very high predictive analytic value, number one. Number two, it's more forward looking. So gold's kind of telling you where things are going to be maybe a year to 18 months from now instead of six months from now. And so, yeah, so gold is signaling that monetary and fiscal policy will fail and something will else will be tried. Uh, and that ultimately will re, uh, you know, result in a much higher price for gold. So gold's just saying, well, let's do it now. You know, look, I've got gold at $15,000 an ounce by 2025. If I'm wrong about that, it'll be sooner and higher. But that's, yeah. well, I, I consider that a conservative forecast. And we can maybe take a few minutes to go into the analytics behind that. I, as I've said before, you've heard me say, I don't, I don't just throw numbers out there to get attention. I don't really care. I do care about getting the analysis right. And there's a number of different 
techniques. And what's interesting is they all point in the same direction. So, so you know, it's got to go to 3,000 before it gets to 15,000. It's got to go to 5,000 before it gets to 15,000. So that's my kind of long range forecast. But, you know, it could go down tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't get depressed when it goes down. I don't get euphoric when it goes up. I know where it's going in the long run. That's the important thing for if you're trying to preserve wealth and make money. You know, nothing wrong with making money. I'm all for it. But, uh, but sometimes preserving wealth you know, and risk aversion is a higher priority than just making a lot of money in the short run. But uh, either way, Gold will serve that purpose and uh, you know preserve wealth over, over that uh, over that time period. Could it go down tomorrow? I guess, yeah. But all the vectors are pointing up uh, very strongly. And I'll give you a, a concrete example. There are three things that drive the price of gold fundamentally. Uh, one that you've already mentioned, which is real interest rates. The lower the real interest rate, the higher the price of gold. Number two, supply and demand. You know, you learn it in your first three days in economics, but it, it still works. Uh, and then uh, number three is geopolitical risk. You know, call it risk off or fear fact, whatever you want to call it. But I, I think of it in geopolitical space. Those three vectors don't all have to point in the same direction. You could have a situation where geopolitical risk is high, pointing to a higher gold price, but real interest rates are, are really high, and that would point to a lower gold price, et cetera. But right now, all three of them are flashing green or maybe flashing gold. The uh, real rates are coming down. Uh, they're still high, by the way. Uh, when, it, when I, I always have to just roll my eyes when uh, like really smart people uh, – Dan Isaacson, uh, Bill Gross, uh, Jeff Gunlock, and I admire them all, and I, fo I, I follow them all. But they've, they've all been carried out feet first on this, you know, bond bubble thing, you know, the greatest bond bubble in history and short bonds, and the interest rates have nowhere to go but up. They're, they're just failing to distinguish between nominal rates and real rates. Nominal rates are low. Real rates are not low. When I say low, I mean, show me negative 4%. That's a low real rate. Yeah, you can pick your notes or, or your bills or whatever. But I usually use the 10-year note rate, a uh, 10-year treasury, because it's a good proxy for building construction, long-term investment. People don't borrow overnight to build a building. They borrow for seven years if they can, et cetera. So to me, that's my proxy for, for sort of economic growth and, and inflation forecasting. That's uh, it's what, about 70 basis points today, et cetera. But inflation is, you know, one, one and a half, uh, take your index. So that puts the real rate, you know, maybe negative 25, negative 50 basis points. Well, thank you very much. But, you know, I remind people in 1980, I borrowed money at 13%, but inflation was 15%. And my borrowings were tax deductible. And the tax rate, I lived in New York City at the time, was 50%. So my real after-tax rate was about negative seven. That's a low real rate. So the point is, we have a long way to go. And um, it doesn't matter, you know, people are interested in whether the Fed's going to pursue a negative interest rate policy, take the target rate on Fed funds below zero. Legally, they could. It's already been done in Europe and Switzerland, Japan, and a few other places. I don't necessarily forecast that. I don't think the Fed necessarily th wants to go there but you can have negative yield to maturity on a 10-year note just when that, whenever the premium is greater than the present value of the coupons it's a negative yield to maturity so you can get there you can get deeply negative rates in secondary market trading regardless of what the fed does and that will happen and so you know in the dbo one dollar value of one basis point is higher as the absolute level of rates gets lower that's just you know duration just bond math 101. So we're going to have huge capital gains in 10-year notes as the yield to maturity goes, you know, towards negative 1%. But that's going to be an enormous boost for gold. Uh, and we're not, we're not even there yet. We're seeing these, uh, we're seeing kind of a spike in gold prices when, when real rates are still, you know, relatively high. They're only mildly negative. I was declarative when I said printing money does not cause inflation, and it doesn't. Uh, again, I'll just use the last 12 years as, as Exhibit A. I, we should probably relate to the viewers what does cause inflation. And the answer is velocity, the turnover of money, the lending and the spending. But the problem is velocity is a psychological phenomenon. The Fed can stick the landing on money supply. They can get it down to a couple of decimal places if they want. But if you want to control velocity, which is the key, that's psychological. So, so what you have to do is change the psychology. Well, what is the psychology right now? It's deflationary. Uh, the savings rate in May was 33%. You know, it had it had been going up. It kind of made its way like from 4% to 7%, but then it spiced to 33%. Well, savings is a good thing. You can drive an economy. If you can convert savings into investment, 
And furthermore, if the investment is productive, unlike what China's doing, uh, but I was, we got some infrastructure or some other projects, R&D, that, that, that would be productive. That can drive an economy. You don't have to drive an economy on consumption. You can drive an economy on productive investment. But the problem is twofold. Number one, it, it has a much longer time frame. That's a five, seven year time frame. And it comes in the short run, at least, at the expense of consumption. Our economy is driven 70% by consumption. If you substitute savings for consumption, you're killing velocity. Because if I put my money in the bank and leave it there, the velocity is zero. And I remind people, $5 trillion or $6 trillion times zero is zero. You can print all the money you want, but if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And, and so the question is, how do you how do you change the psychology, how do you get the, and by the way, it makes sense to say, if you're unemployed, you better be saving because you're maybe lucky if you can pay the rent. Uh, but even people who are working or still have their jobs, they're worried, maybe I'm next. You know, maybe they fired the guy down the hall, but maybe I'm next and maybe I better save more just in case, you know, and so forth. So, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that doesn't make sense. That makes a lot of sense, but understand what it means. It's deflationary. It reduces velocity. It offsets the increase in the money supply, and it's very hard to get out of. I mean, you know, Keynes called a liquidity trap, and he was right. That's what it is. So how do you change the psychology? Well, you need you need something big. You need something dramatic that's going to get people to say, wait a second, what's going on here? Well, one of them would be a $5,000 price for gold. by Jim Rickards, a renowned financial analyst, discussing the ongoing banking crisis and its root causes. He sheds light on the chain of events that began with the failure of banks involved in both traditional and crypto finance. The story unfolds from March 2023, when the FDIC took over Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate Bank, exposing the precarious state of the financial sector. What's fascinating is the revelation of a bail-in strategy that emerged from the ashes of the 2008 financial crisis. This strategy has far-reaching implications for depositors, investors, and the entire financial system. So let's explore Jim Rickard's insights into this unfolding crisis and how it may affect the broader economy. Jim Rickards starts by asserting that the banking crisis is far from over. He explains that financial crises don't happen suddenly in one catastrophic event. They tend to emerge gradually, with regulators and investors believing they have the situation under control until it resurfaces. The crisis he discusses traces back to a lesser-known bank, Silvergate, and Silicon Valley Bank. Jim Rickards highlights the critical link between the crypto world and the traditional banking system. The collapse of cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, in late 2021 served as a warning sign. As Bitcoin's value plummeted from $69,000 to around $13,000 in a year, it raised questions about potential contagion from the crypto market to the banking world. Silvergate Bank played a crucial role as a bridge between cryptocurrencies and fiat money. This dual nature exposed the traditional financial system to the volatile crypto market. Jim Rickards shifts the spotlight to the Silicon Valley Bank crisis, emphasizing the FDIC's response. On March 10, 2023, the FDIC declared Silicon Valley Bank insolvent and announced that only deposits up to $250,000 were insured. For deposits exceeding this amount, depositors received a receivership certificate with an uncertain value. Remarkably, it's revealed that only 3% of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank were insured, totaling approximately $140 billion. This meant that the majority of depositors were facing significant losses, including big names in Silicon Valley like Roku and Cisco. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. The banking crisis is not over. The crises don't happen all at once in one day. They emerge, regulators deal with them, the other new investors come in, they go, oh, it's all good, we got this under control, and then there's two or three months of a quiet period, and then they just pop back up again. It's because they were never fixed in the first place. A lot of people think this all started with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, and that was um, uh, March, uh, March 10th, um, 2023, when the FDIC declared them well, basically took over, put them into receivership. But that's not quite the right starting date. The day before March 9th, 
there was another failure. It was Silvergate Bank, not Silicon Valley, but Silvergate. Silvergate failed, basically closed its doors and went bankrupt. And they were um, they were an, uh, an FDIC insured bank. They were a member of the Federal Reserve System. So they weren't some kind of weird, you know, uh, semi-bank or shadow bank or whatever you want to call it. They were a real bank. But they had one foot in the mainstream banking world at the Fed, but they had another foot in the crypto world. And they were actually a portal between crypto and dollars. And you could buy and sell crypto and get dollars. They would credit your account and all that. But when I saw the crypto collapse coming, or not coming, uh, uh, it, it happened, uh, November 2021, Bitcoin was $69,000 by November 2022. Um, it was down to around uh, $13,000, uh, give or take. So that was a 90, you know, 90 plus percent collapse. And I saw that, I said, well, there's no way this is confined to Bitcoin. And I was right. A lot of crypto exchanges uh, failed. But the question I kept asking myself, is there a danger, and there is a danger, that this will, this will, uh, there'll be contagion from the crypto world to the banking world? That was the question. I goes, crypto, it could all go to zero, you know, knock yourself out. But if it goes into the banking world, we got much bigger problems. And it did. And Silvergate was that portal. Okay. Next day, Silicon Valley Bank fails. And the FDIC did a very interesting thing. They did their job. Uh, and by that, I mean, they issued a press release. The press release came out at 6 p.m. on Friday, um, March 10th, 2023. And it said, we are insuring all deposits up to $250,000. That's what we do. But if your deposit is more than that, you're uninsured. We're going to give you what they call a, a receivership certificate. Um, and, uh, hang on to it we'll get back to you as in terms of what it's worth uh it's you can't cash it in we don't know what it's worth we will then proceed to sell the assets of the bank uh pay off creditors and if as and when there's anything left over we'll distribute that to you on a pro rata basis but you know just hang on we'll, we'll get back to you in terms of what this is worth well it turns out that of course this was all known just said look at the data silicon valley bank only had 3% insured deposits. 97% of the deposits were uninsured and the amount was approximately $140 billion. And they weren't all like, you know, $2 million a round startups. You had um, Roku, uh, Cisco, uh, you know, and other, other names, you know, big Silicon Valley names that had multi-billion dollar deposits. And for that matter, um, one of the crypto, one of the crypto exchanges had a three billion dollar deposit at um, Silicon Valley Bank. In response to the impending crisis, Jim Rickards highlights how high-profile figures, including Bill Ackman and other Silicon Valley billionaires, rushed to the White House, warning that the failure of these banks could have catastrophic consequences for the tech sector. These banks had extended substantial loans to over 200 startups and companies in Silicon Valley. These businesses had payroll obligations, employees, and a significant role in technology development, making their collapse a potential disaster. Within 48 hours, the situation took a dramatic turn. Jim Rickards reveals that the FDIC's initial stance of only insuring deposits up to $250,000 had been reversed. They decided to guarantee all deposits, including multi-billion dollar ones. This sudden reversal, often referred to as a bail-in, marked a significant policy shift. The FDIC, acting in accordance with their announcement at the 2014 G20 meeting in Brisbane, indicated that depositors and investors would have to bear the responsibility of rescuing the banks before government intervention. Jim Rickards shares a fascinating insight in the White House's decision to step in. Many of the companies being financed by Silicon Valley Bank were in the green technology sector. This alignment with green initiatives played a pivotal role in persuading the government to intervene. While it was commonly assumed that these banks primarily supported tech startups, they had a significant hand in financing green initiatives, particularly in battery technology and wind energy. So it wasn't clear that they weren't going to fail. I mean, this this was contagion and recontagion, if you want to think of it that way. So what happened over the weekend between uh, March 10th and March 12th, all the crybaby billionaires, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys, they all go running to the White House saying, you don't understand what you're doing here. We got you know, 200 startups in, you know, Silicon Valley. They're all, they all got like three, five million. They got payrolls, they got employees, they got rent, they got technology development. You're going to destroy the tech sector if you don't bail this out. Um, and so then on six o'clock 
Sunday, just 48 hours after the first sound. By the way, I should add that, um, going back to the Friday announcement, that actually came out of the Brisbane G20 meeting in 2014. In 2014, Brisbane G20, they were, we remember, we were still in the aftermath of the 2008 2009 financial crisis. Right. There was an uproar. Citizens were, uh, pardon my language, they were just pissed off. The taxpayers bailed out the banking system and all the billionaires kept their jobs. So Jamie Dimon, he's still collecting bonuses, Goldman Sachs, all of them. None of them failed. They, they would have failed, mm -hmm. but for the fact that they were all bailed out. But the everyday Americans are like, you know, unemployment's 9%. I lost my job. I lost my, my 401ks down 50%, et cetera. So there was a political reaction to that. So in Brisbane in 2014, they came up with the, not the bailout theory, but the bail-in theory. And right. bail-in means that um, if a bank fails, the investors, the, you know, the, the stockholders, the bondholders, the depositors, they have to basically pay off the creditors. They have to pay off the depositors. Um, and only, only when there's nothing left would the government maybe, maybe chip in. So, so what, uh, and put, and they put the world on notice. The, um, the insured amount in Europe is a hundred thousand euros. US is $250,000, but the whole world was on notice. That's all we cover over that. You're on your own. Well, what the FDIC did on Friday was actually consistent with what they all said they were going to do in 2014. It was a bail-in. And if you had a billion dollar deposit, you're going to contribute to the rescue. Within 48 hours, they did a 180 degree turn. They completely blew away the $250,000 insurance limit. They said, we're, we're guaranteeing all the deposits, multi-billion dollar deposits. By the way, a dirty little secret about what happened at the White House. I said that, you know, the, the, the Silicon Valley billionaires were crying about all these little startups and all this stuff. The truth is a lot of what Silicon Valley bank was financing was, um, green technology. They were a climate bank. And of course, that's all you have to say to the white house. Hey, this is green. And like, oh yeah. Now what were they doing? I don't know. Battery technology, uh, better windmills, uh, none of that stuff works by the way, but, but no. they were, they were in the white house sweet spot by saying green and they they were that was actually what they were financing everyone thinks oh somebody's working on an app they weren't apps they were there was like battery power jim rickards then pivots to another significant event that occurred on march 12 2023 when signature bank not directly related to silicon valley bank faced a crisis the bank where barney frank served on the board was hit hard remarkably barney frank was known for his role in co-authoring the dodd frank act a comprehensive piece of legislation designed to address the failings of the 2008 financial crisis. The reason for Signature Bank's troubles lay in its investment in government bonds. When interest rates surged, these long-duration bonds lost 80% of their value. It's an excellent example of how bond prices are inversely related to interest rates. As rates went up, bond prices plummeted, leaving the bank underwater and insolvent. To address the widespread issue of banks holding bonds with reduced market values, the Federal Reserve offered an interesting solution. The Fed announced a facility where banks could exchange these bonds, which were worth less than their purchase price, for loans matching the face value of the bonds. This meant that banks were putting up collateral worth less than the loan amount they received. So, um, Sega bailed out. At the same time, on Sunday night, now we're talking uh, March, uh, March 12th, they closed another bank, which was Signature Bank. Something about S, you know, Silvergate, Silicon, Signature, all the S's were going down. Now, Signature Bank was another interesting case, which was Barney Frank was on the board of Signature. And if that mm -hmm. name rings a bell, just think of Dodd Frank. Dodd Frank, 2010, thousand page legislation. I know uh, I met I met Barney, I know Chris Dodd very well. Um, that was supposed to solve all the problems of the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, et cetera. Here, the author of the bailout legislation is on the board of the bank and his bank gets shut down. Well, like, what's up with that? Uh, well, the, they had, um, they bought government bonds uh, and when interest rates went up from, you know, 10 year note, uh, treasury note yield to maturity went from like, you know, one and three quarters to like four, all those bonds lost 80% of the value. That's what happens on long duration bonds. You know, bond math is simple, rates up, price down, vice versa. While well, the rates were up, the price was down. So they were underwater um, and insolvent and they got shut down. So Barney Frank's out whining the next day. He's like, hey, yeah, but that's true of every bank in the country. There's not a bank out there that didn't load up on treasury bonds at one and three quarters. They're all underwater. They're all insolvent. Yeah. 
And by the way, the Fed announced a facility. You know, they always have these four initials. I forget what this one was, a B <laughs> or whatever. But um, but basically, what they said was, if you're a member bank and you have Treasury securities that are where the mark to market value is below par, so you paid 10 million, but they're only worth eight million, and that was mm. the case across the board. So they get oh, trillion wait. trillion dollars or more of bonds that were in that category. You can deliver them to us and we will lend you for one year the face value so you're putting up 80 cents of collateral but you're getting a hundred cent loan i said i got a 15 year old car will you lend me the what i paid for it because it's a lot more than it's worth now um <laughs> but that's what they did so now i'm now my head's spinning i'm like well I, mean, I get all this stuff but i'm like oh so you just guaranteed every deposit in the banking system without limit and you just guaranteed every treasury bond at par value without limit. Yeah. What's left? Like, what else do you have in your bag of tricks? Because you don't have it. There's nothing else you can do. Go back to 2008. They guaranteed every money market fund in the country. So, uh, but here's Barney Frank whining. Hey, yeah. yeah, my bank was in trouble, but so was every bank in the country. Why did you whack me and give all these guys a pass? Well, the answer is Signature Bank was another crypto bank. It had a portal called Signet. And Signet was a way, was a portal to the crypto world. And that's why they whacked it. Notice they whacked two crypto banks. Usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last I January. Think. Debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half. Maybe that's continuing. Um, people talk unemployment close to an all time low. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that, that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s but that completely ignores probably eight to ten million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working um, prime, you know, prime age 25 to 54 years old it's never 100 I mean there's always you could be um, a homemaker a, a student um, they're, they're uh, retired early retirees there are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce but not you know, taking 10% off or 14% decline uh, from the starting place in um, uh, over 20 years. That's uh, so if you, if you throw those people into the, un they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs, but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10%, which is a recession or depression level actually. Um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion. So your deficit's out of control and your trade deficit's out of control. I don't want to overuse metaphors, but one metaphor is you have a very beautiful, expensive vase and somebody knocks it over and it breaks into 5,000 pieces. You can't put the vase back together. You've got to go get a new one. And that's what's happened with the supply chain. The What I call supply chain 1.0 1 .0 from 1989 to 2019 is broken. Uh, there will be a new supply chain. There always are. Supply chains have been around since the Bronze Age, if not earlier. But the new supply chain, what I call supply chain 2.0, will look very different than the old supply chain. Right now, we're in an in-between period where things don't work well. Uh, again, it doesn't mean total chaos, but you know, you still see shortages. You still see higher prices, which are coming from supply chain disruptions. Um, and these things are not easy to fix, but they can be replaced. And that's what I expect to happen. We'll hear from them at some point, but we're in a recession now. And people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It's, it, they miss sometimes. They're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which, you know, don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number. But uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. 
and it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. Around November 2021, you'll recall there were headlines, you know, bare shelves, empty shelves, supply chain breakdown, you know, Christmas will be canceled, etc. And it was all true. You you went to the supermarket. It didn't mean that every shelf was completely bare, like uh, you know East Germany in the 1950s. But there, you know, paper goods might not be there, or maybe your favorite kind of tomato sauce, or or you know chicken, or whatever it was. There were some things there, but a lot of things weren't there, and that got worse. And then, of course, was, uh, uh, gas prices skyrocketed uh, because of um, uh, basically because of a lot of bad policy from uh, from the United States in terms of Keystone Pipeline and a lot of other factors. That then you know got worse it eased up a little bit in the summer but it never went away this is a complex system it was breaking down that was very if we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve and you know uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the fed will give you for a phone call i mean all those things are happening that's hard data uh, and it's a very, very troubling sign, less seen in 2008, by the way, before the two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last, how, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? But I found some really, really interesting research that, uh, cause everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it, make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want, we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S.-China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well, <laughs> that's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil. All of a sudden you're a US soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we start selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now, but now instead of shipping them from like Port of LA to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationships. Economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic, but we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries. The fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know, nine months or a year um, after it happened. And for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three, some have been longer, but but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last January. <laughs> Debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half, maybe that's continuing. Um, 
People talk unemployment close to an all-time low. Yeah, but even at 3.5 percent or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s, and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to ten million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working. Um, prime, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old. It's never 100. I mean, there's always you could be um, a homemaker, a, a student. Um, they're they're uh, retired, early retirees. There are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce, but not you know taking 10 percent off or 14 percent decline uh, from the starting place in um, uh, over 20 years. That's uh, so. If you if you throw those people into the un, they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs, but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10 percent, which is a recession or a depression level, actually. Um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion. So your deficit's out of control and your trade deficit's out of control. I don't want to overuse metaphors, but one metaphor is you have a very beautiful, expensive vase and somebody knocks it over and it breaks into 5,000 pieces. You can't put the vase back together. You've got to go get a new one. And that's what's happened with the supply chain. The What I call supply chain 1.0 from 1989 to 2019 is broken. Uh, there will be a new supply chain. There always are. Supply chains have been around since the Bronze Age, if not earlier. But the new supply chain, what I call supply chain 2.0, will look very different than the old supply chain. Right now, we're in an in-between period where things don't work well. Uh, again, it doesn't mean total chaos, but you know, you still see shortages. You still see higher prices, which are coming from supply chain disruptions. Um, and these things are not easy to fix, but they can be replaced. And that's what I expect to happen. We'll hear from them at some point, but we're in a recession now. And people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which you know don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number. But uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Yeah. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with, uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. Around November 2021, you'll recall there were headlines, you know, bare shelves, empty shelves, supply chain breakdown, you know, Christmas will be canceled, etc. And it was all true. You you went to the supermarket. It didn't mean that every shelf was completely bare, like uh, you know East Germany in the 1950s. But there, you know, paper goods might not be there, or maybe your favorite kind of tomato sauce, or or you know chicken, or whatever it was. There were some things there, but a lot of things weren't there, and that got worse. And then, of course, because of, uh, gas prices skyrocketed uh, because of um, uh, basically because of a lot of bad policy from uh, from the United States in terms of Keystone Pipeline and a lot of other factors. That then. You you know, got worse. It eased up a little bit in the summer, but it never went away. This is a complex system. It was breaking down. That was very. The biggest single failure is taking everything for granted, assuming that whatever occurrences happen, whatever bailouts are, con are, are constructed, that the dollar itself will not be called into question. And there is no legal limit on the amount of dollars the Fed can print. There isn't. There used to be. As late as 1968, um, the Fed was required to keep 25% uh, in gold. Uh, by the Treasury has the gold, but there had to be that much gold around. So your your uh, your base money, your M0, could not be more than uh, four times the uh, the gold supply. And earlier, th that, that was even tighter. Um, 
but they abandoned it. This at the time of the Vietnam War when Lyndon Johnson just wanted to print hey, the Great Society in the Vietnam War, so they took it away. Since then, there's been no limit on the Fed's ability to create base money. So when you say, oh, well, the, the bailouts keep getting bigger, and they do, and the, the money printing keeps getting bigger, and it does, but if there's no limit on that, why can't you keep doing it? And that's how the elites view it. They're like, yeah, we'll just print as much as we can. What's the problem? But there is a limit. It's a psychological limit. It's a um, behavioral limit. It, 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 you cross it what physicists call a critical threshold, where you, you, you've gone through the looking glass. It's no, it's no longer more the same with a bigger balance sheet. It's like, you know what? I'm looking at your whole balance sheet. I don't like any of it. Get me out. Yeah. Now, here's where people are, everyday people are much more creative and much more adaptable than the regulators understand. There was a solution on the table that they never pursued because of cronyism. See, now we're getting into the gangster side of it, the, the cronyism side. So what they should have done by executive order and the legal authority was there, they could have nationalized all the big banks. Not permanently, because I'm not in favor of socialism, but temporarily nationalize them. The clean them. What you do is you wipe out the equity. You, first of all, you rip out the bad assets and you put them over here in trust for the American people. So we, it might take 20 years to sell them, but whenever we sell them, that money goes to you, the taxpayers. Over here, we now have a clean bank. Equity, you're wiped out. Bondholders, how big's the hole in the balance sheet? 20% haircut, 40% haircut, whatever it takes. Preferred stock, you're probably wiped out. Put the losses where they, where they should be. Put the losses on the people who deserve it, which are the stakeholders in the institution. Mm. So now you get rid of the bad assets, you wipe out the equity, you now IPO a clean bank to raise new equity, and you start over with Citibank and Goldman, all these guys private with new owners, and clean balance sheets, and we can get the economy moving again. Okay. That is not what happened. What did they do? They took the TARP money. By the way, TARP was the greatest bait and switch in history because Hank Paulson, our Secretary of the Treasury, went to the Congress and said, I want this money so I can buy the um, bad assets from the banks. I want to strip out the bad assets. It's not what he did. He took the money and gave it to the banks as capital, and they kept the bad assets, which meant that when they recovered, the bankers got the profits, not the people. So this was cronyism as first. Nobody went to jail. None of the big banks failed other you know, than Bear Stearns. But that's their starting place. They're like, what's the problem? We can print as much as we want, have as much debt as we want. They actually say debt is a favor to investors. The government doesn't need the debt. Just give us our instructions for Lockheed and we'll send them the money. Why do we have to issue bonds and then pay them? You know, <laughs> cut off the debt. Debt market is a favor to investors. That's actually what they say. Um, but what she's missing, what the advocates are missing, what the Congress is missing, what everybody's missing is that people will have a revulsion against the dollar. Well, there actually were wooden nickels in the 1930s. They, some In a town, there was a severe shortage of money. The Fed completely screwed that up. Nobody wanted to borrow, nobody wanted to lend. They weren't creating any money. And there was a shortage of money. And some carpenter in town would take a dowel and slice it and make wooden rounds and they would stamp it you know, it wasn't five bucks, that was a fortune, you know, five cents or whatever, it was a wooden nickel. And that money circulated, it was money. Money, I think gold is a great form of money. It doesn't have to be gold, though. it has to be, whatever it is, it has to be something that everyone has faith in. If you have confidence that if you take it from me in exchange for goods and services, and someone else will take it from you, and that shared belief is sufficiently widespread, it's money, that's all it takes. They're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the... the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is, you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. But I make the point that, yeah, despite the difficulties, we don't have to be victims. We're not helpless. We don't have to curl up in a ball. It, the, the key is to see it coming. If you can see things coming, you can deal with them accordingly. You can get through them, not only preserve wealth, but actually make money. I always uh, point out the example of um, Hugo Stinnes, and people go, well, who's that? Uh, he was an industrialist in Weimar, Germany in the, the uh, early 1920s, and he could see the hyperinflation coming long before the middle class, long before anybody else. 
he went out and borrowed an enormous amount of Reichsmark, so that, that was the currency at the time, and just bought industrial assets, coal mines, uh, vessels, uh, you know, natural resources, etc. So here comes the hyperinflation. He gives it a little time. He pays back his debts. I would say your pennies on the dollar, like a, a millionth of a penny on the dollar, in other words. Uh, but he paid it back. They were sweeping the money down the sewers, but he paid back his debts and kept all the assets. And he became the richest man in Germany. The Fed's not done. Uh, we're going to see um, at least one more interest rate hike. Um, maybe, but they're going to leave one more on the table. We'll see what happens in June. I'm not forecasting June, but I would not rule out another interest rate hike in June after the May hike. So, um, because they, and they, Jay Powell's like thinking, how many times do I have to say this? He's given nine speeches since August 2022, August 26th at the Jackson Hole, then September FOMC meeting, uh, November FOMC meeting, um, end of November, a speech at the Brookings Institution, December FOMC, congressional testimony, you know, et cetera. And every time he said the same thing. Inflation is job one. We, uh, you know, we, we've got to get unemployment up, believe it or not. They, they, you know, we're going to have a recession and unemployment's going to go up. Sorry about that. But we've got to get inflation under control. So this is uh, unprecedented. It's never been this high. It breaks the pattern of running it up in war and paying it down in peace. No one roots for war, but they happen. Um, and, uh, and it's worse than that because of modern monetary theory. People say, well, Bitcoin's not backed by anything, or the dollar's not backed by anything, or the euro's not backed by anything. And I say, yes, they are. They're all backed by the same thing, which is confidence. Right. If I think something's money, and you think it's money, and I tender it to you for goods and services, and you think you're confident you can give it to Francis for goods and services, and we have a large enough group, it's money. Right. It can be, we were kids, we did this with baseball cards and bottle caps, you know? So anything can be money if there's confidence. but. Confidence is fragile. It's easily lost. And when you lose it, it's very... You, you brought up um, chapters one and two from, from Currency Wars, where you, you basically highlight uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S. dollar. Is that the form it would take for you, something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why. Um... And by the way, when I when I wrote that, and when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in a state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so, but uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, that's not going to be the group. But, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very illiquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market, such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the rupee will not replace the dollar as reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could, 
deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for 50000 in uh, in the 1970s. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized. But there are, you know, natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as ExxonMobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not... Uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, the, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself. But uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one, and you know, banks are going to be in, in distress, money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what the liquidity crisis is. We we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working, and you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a, has seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having 62 percent of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And no, you, you you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the the, the numerator, and how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now it's never a hundred percent, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles entered the workforce and then that number went up. So it, like I said, it's never 100, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit. You know, it's put, a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home, um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But, um, but a lot of people saved the money, but, but there was a very, there were de very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money. They'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, 
it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, there are help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a entry level hamburger person. Um so there are la- the, the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs. And big layoffs, big, yeah. Big layoff announcements coming every day. So um, not, none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if you if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are. As an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw a Phillips curve was flat. Oh, or I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. You, you brought up... Um chapters one and two from from currency wars where you you basically highlight uh, this scenario um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that russia and china would accumulate large gold reserves pool their gold and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the u.s dollar is that the form it would take for you something backed by gold probably and here's why um and, and by the way when i when i wrote that and when we did the war game and when i wrote that russia had about 600 tons of gold and today they have 2300 tons china had about 600 tons of gold and today they have about 2000 tons just slightly less that we know of and they may have several thousand tons off the books in the state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque so russia and china did exactly what we warned the pentagon about in 2009 exactly which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more um so but uh everyone's like well the chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency no it's not going to be the ruble. But, but but here's why uh well there are a lot of reasons but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, uh, no repo, none of the sell- no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market, such as the, uh, the United States, 
Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, somebody with eggs on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as a reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they use a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for $50,000 in, in the 1970s. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized, but there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, the, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself, but. Uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And, you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's, what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a, uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a, it's seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having 62% of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it Low is low. In other words, the, the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say, how many people are working? That's the, the, the numerator. And how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now, it's never 100%, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles entered the workforce and then that number went up. So it, like you said, it's never a hundred, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Just. Who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit. You know, it's a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home. Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 
2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think, a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But... Um, but a lot of people save the money, but but there was a very there were de- very definite spikes in retail sales coming within thirty days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money; they'll go buy stuff, and that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it yeah it 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 um it looked good. But we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks, uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit. A lot of people staying home, watching you know maybe. Uh, the world series or whatever eating doritos but they're not working uh and um uh you know a lot of people out of the habit but they just got used to government handouts not everybody but but some and um the other problem is uh you know because people say wait a second how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look they're help on the science which there are i mean i was right. you know mcdonald's is paying a Thirty-five thousand dollar for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training, and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for you know a uh, entry level hamburger person. Um, so there are la- the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as ten million you know people between the ages of twenty five fifty four who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able bodied, you know, potential workers, but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of. Uh, how stressed businesses and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, but none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I would say if, you, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like, even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's, that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First of all, it's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw a Phillips curve was flat. Oh, well, where I went to school, curves weren't flat, but that's, uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators.